Our Edna's getting married to a New York City stockbroker. One of the wealthiest and most influential fellows. Oh, Frank. Stop it. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a little bragging. Harry and I both came up the hard way. Children are our legacy. Here's to them. For so many years, it was always a point of marriage for an heiress to marry a rich man and increase the family's wealth. And Edna Woolworth did just that. Edna Woolworth was the daughter of Frank Winfield Woolworth, the founder of the F.W. Woolworth Company. His stores were simply called Woolworth, and they were America's first chain of five and dime stores, meaning that all of the items in his stores were priced at five cents and ten cents when he first started. His stores made him one of the richest men during the Gilded Age. He amassed a fortune of over $75 million, enough to leave his descendants financially stable for generations. And he is the grandfather of today's subject, the poor little rich girl. She inherited a chunk of that fortune. So how did she, one of the richest women in the world, die with only $3,500 in her bank account? It seems almost impossible, considering that she started out with over $40 million more than $730 million adjusted for inflation in today's money in 2024. But when you factor in her own crazy spending with a string of husbands who didn't care about anything except for her money, it all seems a little more possible. The thought of her dying broke. The poor little rich girl is Barbara Hutton. She was born into wealth from both sides of her family, but it was the wealth from her mother's side that she became more known for. Barbara was often called the Woolworth heiress. You might be like me and old enough to remember that there was once a chain of discount retail stores called Woolworth. They were all over the United States, then eventually expanded to many other countries, including Canada, Mexico, England, and Germany. As a child, Barbara had access to more money than most people can imagine, but it was what she was lacking that was likely the biggest contributor to some horrible decisions that she made that led to her ultimate demise. Barbara didn't have love at home. Edna Woolworth, the daughter of Frank Winfield Woolworth, was Barbara's mother. Now that we know how Barbara came to be an heiress, back to Edna, her mother. Edna did what her father wanted her to do, marry that wealthy New York City stockbroker, and while the marriage looked good on paper and satisfied her family, she was miserable in it, and it might have played a role in her early death. We'll get there. Edna died when Barbara was only four years old, and Barbara's father, instead of trying to make up for her mother's absence, did the total opposite and neglected the poor child. He would pawn her off on governesses, servants, and other relatives in boarding schools. He never showed her any affection. The truth was that he hadn't really been good at showing his wife much affection either. Barbara's father, the fancy New York stockbroker, who seemed like such a prize to Frank Woolworth, was known to quite openly cheat on Edna. And you know that they say that girls marry some version of their fathers. Barbara was no exception to this rule, and boy oh boy did she ever know how to pick some rotten apples but her husbands were typically worse than her father. Her father was only a cheater. Many of her husbands were cheaters and gold diggers. From the moment that she hit the newspapers as the second wealthiest debutante of the season of 1930, she was a scandal. For a little context, 1930 was also the start of the Great Depression, the worst economic downturn in history. So, while most families were struggling to eat a meal once a day, Barbara was having her coming out ball, one day of festivities that cost $60,000, a little over a million for us today. I'm sure that you can imagine that this did not make her a favorite among the poverty-stricken public. That sets the stage for today's subject, Barbara Hutton, the poor little rich girl. She became poorer with each marriage, and there were seven of them, by the way. Let's get into it. But first, 
If you like these videos about the most scandalous people from yesteryear who make Ty's Hot Mess History a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload content. And please hit that thumbs up to support this video for free. Thank you. Now, on to why you are here. Barbara Woolworth Hutton was born on November 14, 1912 to parents Edna Woolworth and Franklin Laws Hutton. Her mother, Edna, was the daughter of Frank Winfield Woolworth. And from her mother's bloodline alone, she was set for life as far as money was concerned. Franklin, Barbara's father, co-founded the brokerage firm E.F. Hutton, and it was one of the largest financial firms in the country. Most men would have looked at his life and said that he had it all, but Franklin wanted more, especially when it came to women. He didn't care about being married to Edna Woolworth. He wanted other women, and he had other women, quite publicly and quite often. And it was said that Franklin's cheating was just too much for Edna to bear, so she took her own life. Before we go all the way there, I have to say that there are three causes of death that have been accepted as accurate, depending on who you ask. I'm going to start off with the two that did not demand a lot of attention. One was that Edna died from suffocation due to mastoiditis. In this scenario, Edna would have had an infection that went into the air cells of her skull behind her ear, and this would have caused her to suffocate. Another was that she died of heart disease. Now, the story that was more juicy for her peers to spread was that she had taken her own life because she'd had enough of her husband's cheating. And let me be clear, I'm not claiming to know which cause of death is the actual one. I'm just revealing to you what three totally different sets of sources had to say on the matter. But whichever one is correct, what we do know is that on May 2nd, 1917, Barbara Hutton found her mother's lifeless body in their suite at the Plaza Hotel. Barbara was only four years old at the time, and I'm sure that you can imagine that her life was never the same from that point. Her mother was only 33. It was easy for the public to believe the suicide rumor because Franklin's affairs that he had on his wife were not a secret, and who wouldn't eventually get fed up with a cheating spouse? Just two months before Edna passed away, the South Pasadena record reported that Franklin took a trip from New York to California without his wife. I can't confirm or deny that he was spending time with another woman on this trip, but perhaps it does support the claim that Edna ended her life because of his cheating. Edna's death left behind only Franklin and Barbara in their tiny family. They had no other children. And because it was just the two of them, one might think that Franklin would have drawn his daughter even tighter to him so that they could help each other grieve. But no, he moved to California and sent Barbara to live with her grandfather, Frank Woolworth, the retail magnate. One can only imagine how hard it must have been for Frank to have to rear his granddaughter because his daughter was dead. It is so sad when parents outlive their children I don't have any children, but I've seen parents who have lost their children just never recover. That's not the natural order of things, and that will happen again in this story. While Barbara was being cared for by her mother's father, her own father had moved to California. It really can start to seem like he was already building a new life there before his wife passed away. Franklin Hutton's communications with his daughter were minimal for all the years of her childhood. Meanwhile, back in New York, Barbara struggled to find stability. After her grandfather died in 1919, just two years after her mother, she spent the rest of her youth moving from one family member's mansion to the next and a few schools here and there. Outside of that, she lived the life that wealthy girls of her era lived. She attended a couple of finishing schools for young ladies. There weren't a lot of educational opportunities for girls unless their parents made a decision to give their daughters a traditional education. But at finishing school, Barbara would learn everything that she needed to get along well in high society, things like etiquette and social graces. Barbara didn't have a lot of friends, but she had a cousin who was her closest confidant. His name was Jimmy Donahue. 
He was also an heir to part of the Woolworth fortune, and there's no doubt that he understood Barbara in a way that very few people could have. He shared the same struggle of being a very rich kid who was expected to excel in life just because he came from a lot of money. They both had upbringings that were not so pleasant and for the most part, out of the spotlight. But when it was time for Barbara's name to start getting media attention because of her upcoming debut to society, Franklin, her father, showed up to foot the bill for it. He would show up one more time in her adult life, and when you hear what he did, you'll probably wish that he had just left her alone. Having a debutante ball thrown in her honor was nothing more than a standard rite of passage for a girl like Barbara, a girl who was born into wealth in New York City. By the time it was her turn for her ball, these coming out parties had been going on for decades. For daughters whose last names were Astor, Vanderbilt, and Rockefeller, and now, in 1930, it was her turn. It was unfortunate timing for Barbara that she just so happened to be turning 18 at the beginning of the Great Depression. And for that reason, which was completely out of her control, her society debut became an instant scandal. How on God's green earth could her father brag about spending $60,000 on a party, 7000 on the music alone, when people were lined up at soup kitchens trying to stave off hunger pains till the next day? while a nation full of able-bodied men who were willing to work couldn't find jobs. The talk about Barbara's coming out gala seemed obscene under the circumstances, and the public made it known that they did not like it at all. The situation got so hot for Barbara that she had to leave the country and go to Europe for a while, just to escape the media attention. But make no mistake, her coming out party was extravagant, even by rich people's standards. It was held at the Ritz-Carlton, and the music was so expensive because her father had hired Rudy Valley to play. He was one of the most popular singers of his day. He led his own big band, and he was well-known all over the nation, not just New York. The ball was to last all night long, starting with a dinner party for 200, followed by a dance, which was followed by a breakfast party that started at dawn the next day. It sounds like a fabulous party. The rest of the country probably would have been celebrating with her in spirit if they'd had a little food and money of their own. Once the drama of the press had died down, another drama spun off from Barbara's debutante ball. Now, all of her potential suitors would know that she was on the market for marriage, and a young girl with a big inheritance was always a coveted find in that set. For a rich young man, she would make a great match because their families could combine their fortunes and the two could become a real-life power couple. But the problem was that there weren't only young rich men hanging around at these debutante balls. There were also poor men with good names and sometimes even aristocratic titles searching for some young, foolish rich girl to fork over her money in order to shore up his family. These men were called fortune hunters and they had their eyes on Barbara Woolworth Hutton from the start. They may or may not have known about how her father earned his money, but everyone knew what Woolworth was. I can't express how big the Woolworth brand became. For those potential mates of hers, locking her down would be like a present day man being able to marry the daughter of the founder of Apple or Amazon and then have access to her money. Barbara's grandfather had built the tallest building in the world at the time. The Woolworth Building in New York City was the tallest skyscraper in the world from 1913 until the same year as Barbara's Ball, 1930, when 40 Wall Street was built. Then the very next year came the Chrysler Building, which was later dwarfed by the Empire State Building in 1931. But the point is that Barbara came from big money and everyone knew it. And while it might sound like a lot of fun to have as much money as Barbara had, the truth was that it was isolating. People with pockets that deep never know who to trust, or if someone only pretends to love them but has ulterior motives. And poor Barbara, she had a habit of picking the guys who meant her no good at all. They only wanted what she could give them. 
They wanted her money. First, there was Alexis Midvani. I'm sorry, that's actually Prince Alexis Midvani. He came from a broke-ass, bankrupt family who were each doing well for themselves until there was civil unrest in their native Georgia, the Eurasian country, not the state in the USA. Alexis was the youngest of five siblings. He was said to have not been particularly handsome, nor did he have a great manly physique, but he did have a lot of charm. After landing in America, his two sisters married for love. His two brothers married for money, and he followed in their footsteps. His brother David moved to Hollywood where he was able to make $25 a week as a movie extra, but he didn't need to work anymore after he met and married Mae Murray, a movie actress who was at the height of her career. His other brother, Sergei, was able to ditch his job after meeting and marrying film actress and singer Pola Negri. Oddly, neither one of these ladies ever married again after being married to the Midvani brothers. Then there was the baby brother Alexis. Barbara was his second wife. His first one was an Astor, Louise Astor Van Allen. The two women had been friends. You can imagine how tight those social circles get when people have that kind of money. But while Alexis was married to Barbara, Louise Astor was still in love with him. Some sources even say that he never divorced her. But while Louise was in love with Alexis, he was in love with Barbara's money. The pair got married in 1933, and their wedding night should have revealed to her everything that she needed to know about him. He refused to have sex with her that night because in his words, she was too fat. They got divorced in 1935, but while they were married, she bought him some really expensive presents. There were polo ponies, expensive properties all over the country, and his prized possession, a Rolls Royce. And when they got divorced, Princess Barbara's main complaint was, he doesn't appreciate me. Well, he appreciated her money, and he bragged about being able to walk away with all of those expensive presents she had given him throughout their very short marriage. He was able to walk away with it all, the houses, the horses, and the Rolls Royce. Plus, he demanded one million of Barbara's dollars in alimony, and he got it. After using her for material gain and to help him social climb, he was patting himself on the back for now being a millionaire in his own right. Well, karma came quickly for the prince. That Rolls Royce that he gloated about getting from Barbara, he was killed in it. Just three months after the divorce was finalized, here's what happened. He was visiting his sister in Spain. She and her husband were having a small party and Alexis was attending with a woman he was dating. She needed to catch a train about 35 miles from his sister's house, so he left the party to take her. It was reported that he was speeding while driving in the foothills of the Pyrenees. He was going 85 miles per hour down these winding roads when his car struck a culvert, then plunged into a deep gully. Just as his sister's last guests were leaving, she got a phone call from authorities notifying her of the accident and asking her to come identify her brother's body. His companion suffered life-threatening injuries and was treated at a nearby hospital. But the reports said that it didn't appear that she would pull through. She was not named in the reports, and I don't know for certain if she survived her injuries or died from them. I couldn't look it up. Alexis's brothers were notified of his death. They were both in America and made plans to drop everything and get to Spain immediately. One of them was at a party at a country club when he got the news. No surprises there. It's not as if the brothers had a lot of pressing business to drop in order to leave the country. And Barbara was also contacted by the press for a comment. The reporter actually broke the news to her. Barbara responded with questions. Are you sure? And then, when did it happen? Was he alone? After it was confirmed that it was true, she said, quote, I am terribly, terribly sorry. I am not surprised. 
I always felt something like this would happen. He drove like mad. End quote. By the way, by this time she was Countess Barbara. Yes, very shortly after her divorce, she had already gotten married again to another man with another title. Let's talk about him. He was Count Kurt von Hogwitz Reventlau, a German-born Danish count descended from aristocratic military on both sides of his family. And like Alexis, he married Barbara and an Astor. But Count Kurt married the Astor after he married Barbara. And Barbara married him only one day after her divorce from Prince Alexis. The Count had something else in common with Prince Alexis. He would repeat the same pattern of courting Barbara. Woo her with presents and charm, pretend he loved her, then demand money from her. Now, unlike the Prince, the Count's family wasn't completely poor. They still had a castle in Denmark, and he convinced Barbara to come live with him there. Maybe it didn't take much convincing, though. She would get to be a countess and live in a castle. I mean, how romantic does that sound? That's practically every little girl's fantasy. But there was one more condition. He would need for her to give up her American citizenship. And she did it. I should throw in here that Barbara was anorexic by this time. The fat comments from Prince Alexis really took a toll on her self-esteem. But anyway, this relationship with the Count, like most relationships, started out great. They even conceived a son in their first year together. After their son, Lance, was born, things went downhill from there. This marriage was particularly stressful for Barbara because the Count wanted to control every aspect of their son's life, where he would attend school, and what type of religious upbringing he would have were decisions that he wanted to make without Barbara's input. Adding to her stress was trouble back home. In New York City, Woolworth sales girls were on strike. They wanted more money. Their picket signs remarked on how different Barbara's life was from theirs. And there was nothing that Barbara could do about it. Her response to their cries was, quote, do people realize I have no more to do with running the Woolworth stores than I have running the British Empire? End quote. Eventually, Count Kurt asked for divorce, custody of Lance, and a $2.5 million alimony payment from Barbara. Her fear was that Kurt only wanted custody because her son was an heir to a $20 million fortune from her. She feared that her son's life would mirror the worst parts of hers, being wanted by people only because of the money attached to his name. Well, she took action, legal action, and she didn't hold back. In 1935, when the Count was ready to throw in the towel on the marriage, Barbara went to London and filed for a restraining order and to have her American citizenship restored. You see, his request to have her give up her American citizenship came with consequences that she could see like American newspapers marring her name for being unpatriotic. But the repercussion that she didn't foresee was that giving up her citizenship gave Count Kurt complete control over what happened to her and their son. She couldn't have seen this coming when she submitted to his will. She was in love with this man, and she thought that he was in love with her too. But he was just laying a trap to get her money. She got the help that she needed in London. Her request for a restraining order got approved and the renewing of her American citizenship standing was in the works. She had a Barbara's absentee father. Yes, this is where he rears his head again. Barbara had made it clear that her husband was cruel, controlling, and money hungry. So she was taking every step that she could to get her son and herself away from him. Her father showed up to make sure that the couple worked out their issues and stayed together. The nerve of him. If he had been a decent husband and a loving father, maybe Barbara wouldn't have been so desperate for love from just anyone and falling for all these wrong men. But now, at this late stage in her life, he decided to show up and be her father. The Count was in Paris while all of the legal stuff was happening in London. Barbara's father flew to Paris 
to console his son-in-law and to speak to Barbara on the Count's behalf, asking her to consider making up with him. Barbara's father, Mr. Hutton, sat down for a meal with the Count when he was approached by a reporter. The reporter showed him cable communications showing that his son-in-law wanted $2.5 million from his daughter. His response was, quote, All I can say is that these children have been in some sort of a misunderstanding. It's all mixed up and it's all too bad. End quote. Her father told the press that he planned on flying from Paris to London with his son-in-law to help facilitate a meeting between the couple so that they could get back on track. In other words, he was going to accompany his son-in-law on a mission to violate a restraining order, an action that could have put his own daughter and grandson's lives at risk. Long story short, this marriage ended in divorce, with Barbara having to shell out another big alimony payment. But there was a bright side. She got to return to America with her citizenship restored and her son safe and sound with her. No thanks to her father. She loved her son dearly, but she didn't want to have any more children. She would use anorexia as a method of birth control and unhealthy weight management for the rest of her life. Her divorce was finalized in 1938. Then she took a few years off from marriage. Barbara got married again in 1942, and this time it was to a famous man. Cary Grant. On July 8th, they eloped to Lake Arrowhead, California. And honestly, there is no scandal here. She loved him, and he loved her. But you know how they say that sometimes love just isn't enough? This seemed to be one of those situations, though she did divorce him on the ground of cruelty. But they never had a bad thing to say about each other publicly. She said that his career got in the way of their marriage, and she loved him the most because he was so sweet and gentle. They simply parted ways in 1945. He was reported to be her only husband who never asked her for alimony. Want to know what she did next? Listen to this line from the Buffalo News. Quote, After her third divorce, Woolworth heiress Barbara Hutton told the world, I'll never marry again because you can't go on being a fool forever and then went on being a fool forever." End quote. Enter Prince Igor. Barbara became a princess again in 1947 when she married Lithuanian prince Igor Trubetskoy. I'm sure that you already know how this romance went. He told her how beautiful she was, bought her some fancy trinkets, told her that he loved her, she believed it, they got married, then they got divorced. Prince Igor was different from Prince Alexis in the looks department. His dashing good looks were always remarked upon in the press. But Igor seemed to be like Alexis in every other way. When he was in Barbara's presence, he treated her cruelly. When he wasn't in her face being mean to her, he was neglecting her. When Barbara requested the divorce from him, her attorney told the Parisian court that Igor showed her, quote, a lack of affection lack of comprehension, and abandoned her to solitude." End quote. And to be clear, he had completely abandoned her. He wasn't just giving her the silent treatment at home. No, they had been living in a suite at the Hotel Ritz, and he just up and left and moved into his own apartment. But even after he left, Barbara didn't give up. She sent one of her attorneys to his apartment to ask him to come back to her. Well, that didn't go well at all. Here's how the Spokesman Review said Igor responded. Quote, Igor pushed the attorney roughly out the door and said, You tell my wife I do not want to live with her. End quote. Well, that made things pretty clear, right? To you and I, maybe, but not to Barbara. She would have her attorneys to arrange one more shot at a reconciliation in the judge's chambers, but that didn't work out either. She was left with no choice but to move on from this man who had made it ever so clear that he did not want her. But like her husbands before him, except Cary Grant, he did want some of her money. 
Even though she called him the meanest man in the world, he felt entitled to three million of her dollars in the form of alimony. This is how that divorce wrapped up for Barbara. The decree was handed down on Halloween Day, October 31, 1945, by a judge, John Ossie. It was shrouded in so much secrecy that Barbara herself didn't know that her divorce was final until she read about it in a newspaper three weeks later. Just having that out of the way was good enough, but the icing on the cake was that Barbara learned that she would not have to pay Prince Igor any money. His request for alimony was denied. Not only did the judge deny his request for her millions, he also made him pay his own court fees. Nice try, Igor. I can only imagine how disappointed he was to walk away empty-handed from what he thought would have been a slam-dunk case for him, knowing how her previous husbands had been paid off. Barbara had a lot to be happy about. She got the divorce, she didn't have to pay, and now she could move on to her next romance. This time, she said that she would move cautiously. You see how much runtime is left in this video, so you know that she didn't do that. But here's what was printed in the Spokesman Review about her next move. Quote, Now that she's free of Lithuania Prince Igor Trubitskoy, Miss Hutton conceded that she has a new romantic interest, but only a romance of friendship. I'm not going to risk it by getting married, she said. End quote. Well, she kept those words for a little while, meaning she didn't marry the romantic friend right away. We'll come back to him. Her next husband was Porfirio Rubirosa. He didn't have an official title like prince or baron or count, but he had an unofficial title and it was Latin lover. He was an international playboy. This man had sexual affairs with Marilyn Monroe, Eartha Kitt, Ava Gardner, Dorothy Dandridge, Judy Garland, and that doesn't even cover half of his long list of lovers. They might have also called him the Meat Man because the word around town was that he was packing, and I don't mean suitcases. I mean he had a large penis, so worthy of discussion that, you know, the big pepper mills that they use at restaurants? Well, in fine dining establishments, they started calling them Rubirosas. Now, that was them being disgusting, not me. I'm just reporting to you. But the scandal where our Barbara is concerned has everything to do with who he was married to before her and who else he was having sex with while he was married to her. Porfirio was a Dominican diplomat and a race car driver who got married a total of five times in his life. His third wife was Doris Duke. She was an American heiress who came out, as in had her debutante ball, the same year as Barbara. They had actually been friends. They were always mentioned in the news together. The year of their society debuts, Barbara was the second richest debutante. The richest girl of the season was Doris. But all of the papers said that Barbara was the prettiest girl of the season. So you can see how early in their lives, the press started brewing a scenario that would have made competition for these two ladies almost inevitable. But it was up to them, Barbara and Doris, to play into it or not. And I have to say that it looks like Barbara decided to play their dirty game. This is where I think she went wrong. Now, I believe in girl code. And when we are friends with someone, we don't get involved with their exes. Do you play by this code? Let me know in the comments section because Barbara did not play by this code. Doris was married to Porfirio for a little over a year from 1947 till 1948. That would have been while Barbara was married to Prince Igor. But as soon as she was single at the same time as Porfirio, she made a move on him and he went for it. And at this time in Barbara's life, I feel like her heart just went dark and she wasn't really thinking about anyone except for herself. And maybe a string of horrible marriages will do that to someone, but I really don't like how she handled Dora's. On their wedding day, after Barbara said I do to Porfirio, 
She broke her ankle, leaving her confined to their honeymoon suite. And Porfirio, so excited about his new marriage, went out on the town to celebrate by himself. Well, what Barbara didn't see coming, but frankly she should have seen it coming, was that Porfirio was going to cheat on her. And he did it very publicly with a very public figure. Have you ever heard of Zsa Zsa Gabor? She was a very famous actress who was Porfirio's girlfriend while Barbara was his wife. Which wasn't a long time, by the way. Their marriage only lasted for 53 days. Barbara did have to pay him alimony, and I can't feel sorry for her on this one. Because when he divorced her friend, Doris, she saw what Doris had to give him in their divorce settlement. And it was a lot. A fishing fleet. A B-25 bomber, which is strange to me. A chateau in Paris. A whole bunch of sports cars and $25,000 per year until he remarried, which ended up being a total of $125,000 because Doris got to stop making those payments in 1953. That's when backstabbing Barbara made him her problem. So I'm sure that Doris thanked her for being a gal pal and putting an end to those payments for her. Barbara and Doris went on to feud publicly for years. That entire situation is a hot mess scandal for another day. Let me know if you want to hear that story. But where Porfirio was concerned, Barbara should have felt like a fool. After being cheated on in such a public manner, she would lose her man and some more of her fortune. Porfirio would receive from Barbara another B-25 bomber. Why anyone would need one of those, let alone two, I don't know. He also got some expensive jewelry, some polo ponies, a coffee plantation in the Dominican Republic, and $2.5 million. Barbara had the use of this man's phallus for less than two months, and she had to share it. Doris had it for a year, and paid a lot less to get rid of him. She definitely got more bang for her buck, pun intended. But even with this major loss, Barbara still wasn't done getting married. Remember that romantic friend who she was talking about while she was waiting on her divorce from Prince Igor? The one who she said she didn't want to risk losing her romantic friendship by getting married? Well, he became her husband number six. Baron Gottfried von Kram was his name. Voila, she was a baroness again. He was a German-born baron and tennis star. She had known him for 18 years, and during that time when she was waiting for the divorce from Prince Igor, she went to visit Gottfried and his family on her birthday. Nothing came of their relationship at that time, but here they were, a few years later, and things had changed. After a very short courtship, the pair got married in 1955 and they were separated almost as soon as they said I do. There are at least a couple of reasons why this marriage was doomed from the start. One, by this time, Barbara had a lot of issues she'd been dealing with. She'd been anorexic for most of her adult life, from the time that her first husband told her that she was too fat to sleep with on their wedding night. In addition to being anorexic, she also had substance abuse problems and she suffered from depression and Gottfried married her to help her get through those challenges. The problem with that was that she didn't really want any help or she just wasn't ready. Number two, the other reason that this marriage would never last was that Baron Gottfried was gay. He had spent time in prison for one of his same-sex relationships in the 1930s. So it probably came as a surprise to no one that Barbara started stepping out with other men while she was separated but still married to Gottfried. Remember that I told you that Cary Grant was Barbara's only husband, who reportedly did not request alimony? Well, Baron Gottfried might have been the second one. He really just seemed to want to help a friend whose life was spinning out of control, and I never came across what he asked for in a divorce settlement. I'm not saying that he didn't ask for money, I'm just saying that I never came across evidence of that, and I'm only presenting to you what my research shows. I admit that I could have missed it, but I did not see it. 
marriage to her seventh husband, gave her the privilege of calling herself princess one last time. Her final husband was the Laotian Prince Pierre Raymond Don Vin. He had been adopted into a royal family. His work wasn't particularly fascinating. He was a writer and a painter. The prince was also five years younger than Barbara. When they met, she was 52 and he was 47. But by this stage in her life, she looked older than her 52 years. And just by appearances, it looked like there was a bigger age gap than the five years between them. Barbara met the prince while she was living in Tangier, where she had bought a palatial home for herself. They got married in 1964 in a small Mexican village. And yes, he married her for her money. She spent a lot of money on expensive presents for Prince Pierre and showed up with him on her arm at social functions. That seemed to be all that there was to their relationship. Barbara threw a birthday party for herself in 1966 and Prince Pierre was her date. And right after that party, there was a lot of talk about how divorce was on the horizon for this couple. Now, this is something that is strange to me because everywhere I looked in just doing a simple search said that this couple got divorced in 1966. Since her birthday is so near the end of the year, November 14th, I started searching 1967 records to find out details on the divorce and how much she had to pay him in alimony. Well, let me tell you, I searched the entire year of 1967 and nothing shows that they were divorced. The whole year they were showing up to parties, doctor's appointments, and her surgeries together. Her health was declining rather rapidly and the prince was always there, in and out of those hospitals with her. He was still being called her husband, not her ex-husband. And the same could be said for the years 1968 and 1969. Honestly, I didn't see any sign that they got divorced until 1971, and even then it was just mentioned as a small part of a bigger story about the prince. So, I'm saying all of that to say that I don't know when they officially divorced, but I did see a quote from him that said, she gave me more than $4 million. She gave me love. The prince was quite lucky to get that love gift of $4 million because by this time her fortune had dwindled down significantly and it's not hard to figure out why. There was her own lavish spending on properties, jewels, cars, and vacations, plus all of the divorce settlements she had paid over the past 30 years. And I have to tell you this, because I'm confident in my research and I have an entire year's worth of news articles showing that Barbara and the Prince were married for the whole year of 1967. I can also say that he was openly cheating on Barbara, which we know was nothing new to her. In March of 1967, he was publicly dating a German actress named Fira de Winter. He had met her on a golf course in Spain just before Barbara's birthday party in 1966. At some point, Barbara did divorce him, and years later, when she looked back on their relationship, she said that Prince Pierre was just the same as the others and was only there for her money. The romantic love was never in the cards for her. She did have one person who loved her, her son, Lance, and she loved him so much. Despite growing up, seeing his mother in so many crazy relationships and not having much of a relationship with his own father, Lance had turned out to be a really great man, just a good guy. Lance was the child Barbara had with her second husband, Count Kurt. He was her only child and that was by her design because she became so obsessed with being thin that she never wanted to gain baby weight again. Lance was profiled in the Press and Sun Bulletin in 1958 when he was 22, and most of what was written about him made him out to be a really kind and level-headed person. Here's just some of what was detailed about him. He was tall and good-looking. He had access to millions of dollars. He owned an airplane and several luxury cars, including a Rolls-Royce and a Ferrari. And he had his own chef and butler, and of course he had a mansion in Beverly Hills, but his mansion only cost $200,000, which was a lot less than he could afford. 
But that kind of summed up who he was. Someone who had it all, but didn't need to spend it all, or show off all of it. Very much the opposite of his mother. Lance seemed to approach everything in a sensible, level-headed manner. He knew the importance of work, and he liked working. He made his hobby his job. Lance loved racing cars, and he learned how to build them in order to sell them. That was his operation. Lance was also keenly aware of the fact that he was envied for his money. At the time of this interview, he was engaged to the up-and-coming Hollywood actress, Jill St. John. She noticed the envy regarding his money, too, chiming in to tell the reporter that when Lance wins a race, the sentiment from most people was like, of course he won, I'd win too if I could afford a car like that. And when he lost, people would just call him a lazy bum, too rich to care about practicing and excelling at his sport. He said that he had a wary eye for young women who were willing to marry him. He didn't trust everyone's intentions. His own words, quote, How do you know whether they're interested in you as a human being or your money? That's the trouble with being born rich. It's both a curse and a convenience. End quote. If only his mother had a better handle on that question. Lance deeply loved his mother, but he saw her as someone who completely lacked the ability to be a good judge of character. At this point, she thought that all of her ex-husbands might have still been good men, while Lance said that he could see through all of them, his own father included, who, at the time of this article, Lance hadn't spoken to in 10 years. He said that his mother never hurt anyone except for herself. We know that wasn't true because she certainly did hurt Doris Duke after she married the lady's ex-husband, but that was just Lance looking at his mother through the eyes of a child. Other than that, he was spot on about his assessments of his mother but he could only concern himself with his own actions, and he was determined to be better, and he was. Not only did he like race car driving, he was really good at it and won a lot of races. He won the International Grand Prix and the Governor's Cup in 1958. He was well respected by his fellow drivers, who would remark on how good he was, but more importantly, how safe he was. They said that he never took stupid risks on the track, and didn't mind pulling back from the lead if it meant that at the end of the race, everyone could go home alive. He was really just an all-around good kid who happened to be rich. For whatever she had messed up before, Barbara got one thing right for sure. Her Lance. She reared a very rich boy who had all of the right qualities. Compassion, intelligence, self-awareness, a good sense of humor, and a desire to be a genuinely good person. His money didn't corrupt him. He saw it as just another thing that he had, and he would have a lot more of it after his mother died, as was written in the Press and Sun Bulletin, quote, Upon her death, Lance will inherit all her holdings, end quote. In the natural order of things, this is the way that it would go, but her precious Lance would never inherit his millions for he would die seven years before she did in an horrific plane crash on July 24th, 1972. And no one could have seen it coming. If anyone would have had to make a guess on such a morbid matter as his death, they would have guessed that a car crash would have taken him out. He did end up marrying Jill St. John, and they divorced because of his car racing. When the whole story was pieced together, It came out that for some reason, a young, unlicensed pilot was flying Lance and his friends around Aspen, Colorado. Their destination wasn't exactly clear. The emphasis that Lance had always put on safety in his sport made the news all the more ironic to his loved ones. They were all shocked and hurt, but probably no one more than his mother. At this stage, she was done with all of her husbands and would never marry again. Her physical and mental health were fading quickly. On the rare occasions that she was well enough to be in public, she was usually belligerently drunk. She was making headlines for being in and out of hospitals for various surgeries and treatments. Her fortune had dwindled down to practically nothing. In a kind of ticker tape style, 
Her weight was reported as 98 pounds. She was so frail that she had to be carried around like luggage. She lived her entire adult life spending excessively and looking for men to love her in an effort to cure her pain. But after Lance died, there was no point in even trying. His death was what finally broke her spirit. She became a recluse and moved into a hotel suite. Her finances were in such a shamble that she had to start selling many of her expensive items just so she could pay her bills. Woolworth was the name that made Barbara famous and one of the richest women in the world. By Woolworth's 100th anniversary in 1979, it had become the largest department store chain in the world. It was a great year for the company that was memorialized in the Guinness Book of World Records. That was also the year that Barbara died. On May 11th, 1979, she died, alone in her penthouse suite at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. The official cause? A heart attack brought on by anorexia nervosa. Just weeks before her death, at her final doctor's appointment, she weighed in at a frightening 82 pounds. And her funeral was as sad of an event as you can probably imagine. The Daily News described the day as dark and with rain-swollen clouds filling the sky. It took place at the Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. Her remains were laid to rest in the Woolworth Mausoleum on top of her sons. And only ten people showed up to her burial. Ten. I hope that one of those attendees was Philip Van Rensselaer, because he certainly did not waste any time writing a tell-all memoir about her after she died. His book was called Million Dollar Baby, and it was on the shelves just months after Barbara passed away. He had only been her friend up until her late 50s, but she died at the age of 66. I'm not saying that he didn't attend her funeral, but I didn't see his name listed among the attendees. And that being said, I wasn't able to find a full list, so I'll have to give him the benefit of the doubt. But it still looks tacky that someone who was not a friend till the end was so quick to capitalize on her death. The thought of being super rich seems like a lot of fun to a lot of people. And yeah, I get it. Probably most of us want a little extra money. But there is a dark side to being very rich. Too many people only see you for the money you have. Here are a couple of newspaper quotes that might help us to understand Barbara a little better. This one is from Barbara herself. She said, I won't say my husband's thought only of my money, but it had a certain fascination for them, end quote. And this one is a question from a reader and an answer from a columnist. LP from St. Louis asked, what makes a woman like Barbara Hutton, who's always had everything act the way she does. This is her seventh divorce, if rumors are true, for heaven's sake. And I thought that the response from the columnist was insightful. The reply was, has Miss Hutton had everything? At four, she saw her mother die. At seven, her grandfather. And at 12, her grandmother. Her first parties consisted of a group composed of an insensitive grandfather, his nurse, her grandmother, who had by then lost her mind, and her grandmother's keeper. My father was young and very busy, she has said. He loved me, of course, but I was only an ordinary, rather stupid little girl, and I couldn't be a real companion to a gay, brilliant man, could I? Of her mother, she has spoken in even more revealing terms. I hardly remember her, she says but I have missed her all my life." End quote. At the end of the day, Barbara was just a very rich woman who was looking for someone to love her. So while her extravagant spending was over the top and not so wise, if we look at it through her lens, those spending sprees 
were among the few occasions in which people were nice to her. When she was spending money and they were earning huge commissions, they would flash a smile her way that seemed genuine. You can be sure that she got more from shopping than just the items she was purchasing. This was a woman who paid for her friends to be around her, and she knew that they were there for her money because if she didn't pay up, they didn't show up. And her poorly attended funeral proves that. Barbara Woolworth Hutton inherited $42 million in 1930 and died with $3,500 in 1979. Now, maybe we see how it all happened. Barbara Hutton was born in the same year that the Titanic sank, 1912, just several months later. She was born exactly three months after John Jacob Astor VI, the boy they called the Titanic baby. His father was the richest man on the Titanic, who died a gentleman's death, helping a number of women and children and even a few animals get to safety on that very early morning. His wife was the young Madeline Astor. She gave birth to the Titanic baby on August 14th, 1912. Barbara Hutton was born on November 14th, 1912. In addition to being born into big money, Barbara and John Jacob VI have something else in common. They were both called unflattering names by the press when it was time for them to hit the high society scene as adults. Barbara was the poor little rich girl, and John Jacob was the rich boy nobody wants. I published a video about his miserable existence that you can see here. I'll leave a link to it in the description box. My sources for this story are South Pasadena Record Archives, 1917 Poor Little Rich Girl, The Tragic Life of Barbara Hutton by Oceana Tepfenhart for Medium. The Buffalo Times Archives, 1917. Daily News Archives, 1930, 1931, 1935, 1945, 1966, 1967, and 1979. Morning Free Press Archives, 1930. The Tampa Times Archives, 1930. The Brattleboro Reformer Archives, 1930. Star Tribune Archives, 1930. Arizona Daily Archives, 1930. The Buffalo News Archives, 1935, 1966, and 1976. The Journal Archives, 1936. The Kansas City Star Archives, 1938. The Spokesman Review Archives, 1951. Democrat and Chronicle Archives, 1958. Press and Sun Bulletin Archives, 1958. The Peninsula Times Tribune Archives, 1972. The Miami Herald Archives, 1976. News Day Archives, 1979. And The Sun and the Erie County Independent Archives, 1979. This video has been brought to you by me. Well, my Patreon is a sponsor for this video. If you like these dirty scandals on my channel, then you'll love my Patreon. Ties too hot, hot mess history. It has all of the stuff that I can't talk about or show here because it's just too hot, too violent, too sexual, too graphic, too much. Come and join us there for the hot, hot mess history. The link is in the description box.